Good afternoon, everyone. This is Emiliano Diaz de Leon, Men's Engagement Specialist with the Texas Association Against Sexual Assault. So, thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar, Climbing the Ladder of Manhood, Power, Race, and Masculinity today with Jeff. And we are so grateful that you could join us. And we are looking forward to engaging in a very rich discussion um, on today's webinar. I want to encourage all of you, again, to continue to introduce yourself inside of the chat box which is at the right-hand corner of your screen. Please feel free to share your name, your title, your organization. Also feel free to share any comments or questions or any insights that you might have, any resources uh, that you want to share with folks. Uh, we're really grateful that, that you could join us for today's webinar. And I uh, want to encourage you to also share on social media. And um, earlier shared uh, the link to uh, Jeff on Twitter and hire and learn as well, um, as well as TASA. So feel free to tag us in any tweets, any posts on, uh, on Twitter or Facebook or on Instagram. Uh, again, thank you so much for joining us and I will pass the floor over to Jeff. Jeff, thank you so much for being with us today all the way from Toronto, Canada. Well, greetings from a very chilly, chilly day here in Toronto and I'm very thankful uh, to all of you uh, for joining us and thank you to, to Tassa and, and the organizers for making this happen. Really wonderful to be with you all and I'm looking forward to some of the conversations that will start from this, this day forward and hopefully continue in your different spaces and places. So again my name is Jeff Pereira and I'm a, I've been doing this work for about uh, eight years around inspiring men to think about ideas of what it means to be a man, how we can help end gender-based violence and move towards change in our society. Um, I started a site called Higher Learning which I'm starting this year to get back up and running as far as new content. You can check that out. And uh, throughout the presentation the Twitter handle will be at the bottom along with the hashtag Higher and Learning. I also encourage you to tweet at TASA. Their, their Twitter handle is T-A-A-S-A. -A -A. Very simple. So please engage in the conversation here in the chat box as well as uh, online if you can. I'll try to keep some time at the end for questions and answers, but uh, please feel free to share any thoughts, uh, any, any feedback, or any questions throughout the session. We'll do our best to uh, get to all of you during this hour. And of course today's session is a deeper look at everyday masculinities, connecting with men on the ways um, issues like race, social status, power and violence impact our pursuits of male identity and what it means to be a man. And it's very important to start off by saying that, uh, you know, I, I know for myself and for many of the folks who identify as men who do this work, uh, the path was paved by the blood, sweat and tears of many incredible women. And we are fortunate to stand on the shoulders of these incredible women who have done work around gender equity and opening our, our eyes to how freer different ideas of gender will impact and affect us all to move us towards a world without violence. I think of all the indigenous women, Muslim women, black women who uh, have been a great influence to me and to other men and thankful for their leadership and for their thoughts and wisdom. And I also think of influences in my life. I turned 40 last year and I outlived Martin Luther King who was definitely one of my one of my great heroes and I think of how Dr. King led his work in the concept of love, leading in love and love to me is, is, how, is how he lived it. Love is strength, love is accountability and love is justice. So I know we're, we're here after Martin Luther King Day, uh, you folks uh, recognize him in the States. Uh, unfortunately in Canada we don't have a day uh, to recognize Martin Luther King but uh, I think every day is a day to live forward and in his honor and, and do the work and continue the work. His dream is our goal. So hopefully we can, uh, that his, his presence will be with us in the, in the next hour. So of course what I want to share with you is lessons from the classroom of healthier manhood. I don't come to you as an expert, I come to you as a student, someone who's undergoing a lifelong process of learning and unlearning and trying to share in my notes with other men, young men and boys, um, in learning from people of all genders around how these ideas are affecting us all and how we can create a world of change. So I want to start off by asking you a question. How many of you have been stuck in an elevator before? If you ever ask that question to people, you get some really interesting stories 
I got to tell you, around the country, I've been asking this question in my talks and sessions. I was stuck in an elevator just over a year ago. It, was, you know, it always happens at the unfortunate time when you're in a rush and you're really busy. And I was in the elevator on the second floor with a woman. And, uh, you know, so you realize, you're, you know, you're not moving and it dawns on you, okay, I think we're stuck. And so she hit the security button and uh, we talked to security and they're assuring us that everything's okay, checking in to see we're all right and help is on the way and just assuring us that everything will be all right. And so we got off that call and then she started to jitter a little bit and hit the security button again and talk to them. This time her voice was a little elevated a little agitated, you could see her anxiety was crawling, and I started to think in my head, oh boy, you know, I really wish I was alone in this elevator. This person's anxiety might make my anxiety go up, and et cetera, et cetera. So we started talking, and we spent half an hour in that elevator, just the two of us, and about halfway through the conversation, she stops and she says, you know, I'm really glad you're in this elevator with me. I would hate to have been in here alone. And I thought to myself, oh my goodness, I'm such a horrible person. <laughs> about, you know, just not too long ago, I was just wishing you weren't here. So it got me thinking about this question, which I think is such a pivotal question for us to ask as people. Am I the type of person that people would want to be stuck in an elevator with? <laughs> you know, something to think about, right? What is your reputation? What do you want it to be? When people think of you, what is your legacy? And I think of this when, I, when talking to people who identify as men, uh, young men and boys, to think about the impact they have in the world and who they want to be in this world and what that looks like. My friend Hannah Markham has this great quote, it's an important moment for men to look at themselves and decide who they want to be in this world. So speaking of elevators, my friend Nikki shared this story of a, a, a friend of hers named Chris. And Chris was a tall white man. Uh, an intimidating looking guy, big guy, and he was in an elevator in a parking lot garage here in Toronto, a very dingy, dark garage, and he talked about how the door opened one day uh, in the elevator, and outside was a woman that wanted to get in the elevator that was waiting to get in, and the woman looked up at him and said, I'm sorry, do you mind getting off the elevator so I can get back on? I don't feel safe. Now, I don't judge anyone for their response to that, that question. I, I'm sure some people would say, well, she has no right to ask that. It's an elevator for anyone. And he has a, as much a right to be there as anyone. Or she needs to get over it. You know, it's just, it's just too much. And I don't judge you for, saying, for thinking that or for people thinking that. But what I'm hoping is that more men, when they are in a situation like this, will stop and think, wow, what has she been through that she has to ask me that question? What has she been through that she's afraid to spend 10, sec or 10 seconds even in a closed box with me? So I, I think it's, it's very important for us as men to learn to see the invisible, meaning being able to understand and see the things that don't affect us because of our male privilege, things that we're not aware of that are happening right in front of us. When we meet up with a person for coffee in the boardroom, uh, you know, on the basketball court, certain things that are happening that we're not seeing that are affecting women and girls, people of all genders, and being able to understand that. James Baldwin has this great quote, if I love you, I have to make you conscious of the things you don't see. And I think that really resonates for me uh, in the work that we're trying to do with men. So in learning to see the invisible, this is a piece around a getting men to recognize the reality for women and girls, but also understanding how aspects of identity race, social status, um, issues like ableism, uh, homophobia, transphobia, how these different aspects of our identity impact ideas of worth and value as men. You know, I think most of you are probably could do a better job than me speaking to gender and to the constructs of gender and the ideas of, of gender and how it impacts all of us. And I would love to learn from all of you around this conversation as well. And as you know, a society creates a very binary idea of gender that's one or the other, male or female. And there's a very narrow concepts, very narrow ideas that you're either, you know, one or two, right? Uh, if, you, if you love wearing beautiful nightgowns or, or evening gowns or fuzzy underwear uh, and walk around with a hatchet, I, I have no issues with that. But uh, I think we need a lot more 
diverse ideas of who we can be, the spectrum of who we can be when it comes to gender. And of course, people of all genders, all different walks of life, there's so many different ideas of what that can look like. And I think we need a, a society in the world where we can be free to be who we are and the best version of, of who we are. Because of course, when it comes to gender, the reality is there is no box. That's, that's what it should be. But uh, the world we live in tries to push us in a very narrow box, in a very narrow idea. And it's one of two boxes, a box for women and a box for men. And there's been some incredible men in the States who've talked about the man box and what that looks like. I like to um, expand on that and talk about something in addition to that, the work that I do. And I talk about a ladder because I think this helps us understand different aspects of our identity, um, phrases like intersectionality and diversity, understanding how all these different layers of who you are as a person impacts and affects uh, your everyday life. When you think of how it starts at such an early age, before you're even born, people are pushing you into a box and creating ideas of who you are. But what happens at an early age, and it continues for the rest of your life, is there are pressures put on you as a man if you identify as male, people identify you as male, that you have to be tough, strong, have all the answers. You're the solution, not the problem. And anything less than that is considered soft, considered weak, considered feminine. So two things are happening. From, from a very early age, from even like you know, three years old, we begin this climb, this pursuit for this impossible, unattainable idea of manhood that we're going to spend our lives climbing and striving for. And in doing that, we devalue anything considered weak, considered soft, considered feminine. So these are very, very narrow ideas that I use, I describe as the ladder of manhood. This pursuit um, from, from uh, you know, to, to achieve this impossible, unattainable idea. I appreciate that note around the genderbred person. I, did, I didn't realize that. Uh, that. That's really good to know, and I apologize. I didn't know that in advance, and I would love to find a, a better resource to use to share around that. Uh, so thank you for that. I appreciate that. So with the ladder of manhood, this pursuit and journey, what ends up happening is we eliminate or carve out ideas of gender and define them as masculine or feminine traits. So ideas like love and empathy, emotional intelligence are decided to be feminine, so-called feminine traits. And pursuits like aggressive, being assertive in life, those are seen as masculine traits. But what that does, what that ends up happening is that we walk around as hollow beings, incomplete, not the full holistic idea of who we can be as people in our society. And for a lot of young men right now, and men of all ages really, you're kind of left on your own to figure things out. So if you don't have a role model, a guide to talk to, uh, you're, you're kind of lost in the woods trying to figure you know, what it means to be a man, what that looks like, and what the path is. A phrase that I use is that we need more maps to manhood, more guides to the ideas of what it can look like and what it can be, and not left to the things that we see in music and TV, uh, in the neighborhood and around us, these narrow ideas. And of course the pressures for men, is, as you all know, to be a man is a very uh, heteronormative idea, uh, to be the man, to get the job, get the girl, right? all these different pieces, these narrow ideas. And, and I think it's important for us to encourage men to think about what are the traditions of manhood that are handed down where we work, live, worship, play, and study. So, what, and, you know, for example, in campus spaces, what are the traditions of manhood that are handed down in these spaces? It's important to think about and be present. Because the reality is the formula for manhood is to prove you're not a woman. The formula for manhood today, as it has been, is to prove you are not a woman. This, to me, it really explains how this issue affects all of us. Women and girls, people of all genders, people who are from the LBGT 2SQ community uh, are, are, are oppressed by these narrow ideas of gender. And the ideas for men become very rigid as far as who they can be and how to be it. So, you know, ideas like the way we perform in our masculinity, uh, the ways, you know, you have to eat like a man, right? You've got you to gotta, you gotta talk like a man, you've got to bake like a man. Every, everything you have to do is in this very rigid idea that really limits our humanity and our ability to connect to the best version of ourselves. And I think for young men, this is a real important time for us to encourage others to embrace 
the impact and, and the, the, the role modeling that we do with them. Because for them, the pursuit of being a man, it's one way to be a man. It's to be the man, you know, to be flawless, to be perfect, to not show vulnerability, to always get the girl in all those different pieces. And this, this pursuit is really affecting us in so many ways, in so many toxic ways. And really what we're talking about is power. The idea of holding power and having power and what a toxic idea of power looks like. Men are coded with a governing belief that their sole value is in holding power. Their entire lives become a conflicted struggle to achieve it. So this leads to, of course, what we call frailty amongst men, right? So many of us in society are tippy-toeing around very fragile, delicate ideas of who men are and their fragile egos and a lot of grown men in their 30s and 40s and 50s were stuck, uh, still stuck as, as much as adult boys, really. So this, this issue speaks to a lot of our everyday actions and interactions. When we think about accessing power and what that looks like, where do the different aspects of identity leave us on the ladder? So if you are an indigenous man or a native man, if you are a man of color, if you're a man who's differently abled, come from a different social economic background, where does that place you on the ladder in the pursuit of manhood? Where you're trying to reach this, again, unattainable idea. There's only a handful of men who are at the top of this ladder, and they themselves are still trying to attain an idea, right? So power and privilege to me is a big part of the conversation. Looking at where that places us in society and how this becomes a bit of a competition amongst men into this construction. LeBron James was on the cover of Vogue magazine, I believe this is 2009, and it caused a huge uproar um, for folks who kind of got the, the hidden reference and uh, how it brought up hundreds of years of realities for men in America being painted and dehumanized as sexual savages, as gorillas, as less than human. And this left black men in a place right now, to this day, where they're struggling to be seen as equals, struggling to pursue this idea of manhood, and they're further down the ladder, if you will. So what they have to do is they have to turn up the volume on their idea of manhood. So hyper-masculinity, right? So they have to act extra tough and extra hard as a way to combat the inequality and how they're seen as lesser than. And I think this translates, and when you look at black, black culture and black pop culture throughout the years, we've seen great examples of black men who have tried to transcend by not just saying, I am a man, I am the man, in, in the way that they perform, uh, they, they carry themselves with confidence to combat racism, um, whether it's Muhammad Ali or hip-hop artists of today, how this is part of their their tradition and part of their reality, because this goes way back, right? This goes way back to um, too many years in the States of fighting oppression and racism and inequality, and still to this day, um, you know, I think of the Black Lives Matter movement, and I think of how it's so important for us to recognize how these issues are, are issues that we all have to work on. When you feel less than, when you feel powerless, how do you access power? Thinking in the mindset of the men and young men that many of you work with, um, for them, they're left with these different ideas of what it means to then pursue this idea of manhood. And domination is the big piece, to dominate and always be in control. So the women in our lives become trophies, become objects that we try to attain to kind of prove and assert our manhood. So when you have four young men standing on the street and a woman walks by and they street harass her, they make comments about her body, maybe even try to touch her um, without consent and harassing and, and, and violating her. They're doing this not because they think this is a great way to meet their future partner. They're doing this to impress the boys. They're doing this to achieve social status. They're doing this to feel good about themselves and feel power, to feel control. So women become rungs on the ladder. Women and girls in our lives become the rungs on the ladder of manhood that we as men use to try and strive for this idea of manhood. So the people in our lives become either obstacles or instruments, ways that we can achieve or things that are in our way, barriers to getting, again, this toxic idea of being the man. 
we were very fortunate when I worked with White Ribbon in 2014 uh, to bring actor Terry Crews to speak with us. And if you haven't, uh, he has a great book out called Manhood, which is a memoir of his story growing up and how he identifies as feminist. Um, I know that's, that's another conversation, very challenging as far as uh, labeling yourself as a male trying to be an ally. But he chooses to identify as a feminist. And he talks about how toxic ideas of manhood affected his father, affected his brother, and affected him growing up. And how he's very frank and vulnerable and talks about some of his learning. You know, and he says uh, to us, in a hyper-masculine world, you see people as tools. And now I see them as family. I think that's such an important uh, piece. Uh, Amanda, I, I believe that, uh, and I think Emiliana will explain this later on, um, the slides, the presentation will be available afterwards that you can look at. Uh, there's a question here. How do you uh, differentiate between establishing manhood and establishing yourself as a person who is a man? I think that's a great question because masculinity is not exclusive to quote-unquote men, right? Masculinity, traits of masculinity, so-called ideas of masculinity, I think are things that people of all gender can embrace. And I think for me, what we're talking about today is looking at how there's a difference between masculinity and toxic hyper-masculinity. And the unfortunate thing is that the, the road in society pushes us as men to pursue manhood through hyper-toxic masculinity. But not recognizing that manhood can be a wide spectrum of different things and is a beautiful thing that we need to um, encourage one another to explore more and discover. The quickest way up this ladder is through violence. You know, I walk into a room and I don't know anyone. I don't feel very powerful. I walk into a room with a gun. All of a sudden, I have everyone's attention. I have a very false idea of respect, a very narrow idea of respect. And this is the quickest, easiest way to achieve, again, a narrow idea of respect to climb the ladder. And I think of, I think of how, you know, right now in this day and age especially, uh, verbal violence in relationships, uh, in-person situations, but also online, how it's a growing, growing issue that we need to discuss around online violence and uh, a lot of the shaming, trolling, and horrible situations uh, that affect men uh, of all ages. And, and, and men in turn are, are pushing on others, especially how we harass women online and target them um, for all sorts of verbal violence. So it's recognizing the power of our words and where these words come from as far as you know a lot of our a lot of our offensive terms are based in in terms of devalue women devalue um, the LBGT community so it's important to really embrace what that means and what we're saying and of course too many of us as men and young men are fluent in the language of violence and this is another huge problem that we need to encounter and take on uh, and, and, and have more deeper and honest conversations around and if you are successful in this narrow idea of being a man, this toxic pursuit of manhood, you're failing as a human being. And I think it's important for us to highlight that and have spaces where we can get men to open up and talk about this and talk about how these quiet secrets that we don't share with each other as men and the people in our lives, because we become islands to people. And how we're not talking about the struggles and the, and the, and the hurt, the sadness, the alone that we feel. Uh, and not being able to make friendships, not being able to bond with people in ways that aren't healthy, that are, are toxic and not healthy. And how this in turn affects people of all genders and, and oppresses many people in our society. We need to break the continuous cycle of broken men and recognize how that is such an, an issue, a core root cause for all of this. And being a better man, it means not being better than other men. Right? We're not trying to reinforce competition or domination. Being a better man means being better than your former self, how you are growing and striving to grow every day and to achieve, you know, just being better as a person. My friend Elliot Vaev is a Brazilian jiu-jitsu instructor here in Toronto. And he teaches uh, jiu-jitsu training for women in a self-defense program he calls Fight Like a Girl, which is a, a play on the phrase, Fight Like a Girl. And he realized, you know, he said, even if we taught every woman in the world to defend themselves, why would we ever accept a world in which they have to? And he realized that he's missing half of the conversation. There's another half of the population that has to be at the table. And it's the people who identify as male that he works with. 
So he created a program, uh, another self-defense program for men called Fight Like a Man. But the focus is more on developing character and integrity and healthier ideas of manhood and how that can translate into how we can serve to um, use our strength in a positive way and be someone who brings peace into a space and peace into the room and peace into our lives. To me, this is the phrase I would love to hear people more and more accept, and young men especially, especially to embrace. I don't need to be the man in order to be a man. I think this gets at the root causes of a lot of this stuff and opens us up as men to pursue a very healthy, uh, holistic idea of who we can be as men. So let's start something. Let's start these conversations and spaces where we are and encourage these, these dialogues to happen and encourage men to explore what it means to be a better man. So really quickly, I want to I wanna show you an image, and I, I don't want to spend too much time on it because we're, we're limited for time. But I want to ask you, who are you in this picture, in this photograph? And I want you to think about yourself and think about the men, young men and boys that you work with, whether it's in a professional way or even just the people in your lives, the men, uh, young men and boys that live on your street in your place of worship or uh, you know the school you go to the places you work and of course for many of you again as I said as professionals the men, the men that you work with in different uh, in different ways and who do you want them to be in this picture this is a photo taken from the Boston Marathon uh, over 40 years ago now at the time women are not allowed to run in the marathon it was deemed that women didn't have the ability the capability uh, and the endurance to run in a marathon and if you think about 40 years ago 40 plus years ago, that's not too long ago for these attitudes to exist. So the woman in the center, uh, number 261, is Catherine Switzer. She was a runner at the time, and uh, she registered for the Boston Marathon through the mail using her initials KV Switzer. She showed up the day of the race wearing a hoodie to cover her face and her hair, went to the registration table and got her number and did her paperwork and then went to the starting line, took off her hoodie and put on her, her numbers and joined the race, the marathon with the men. So off she went. Now you can see to her, behind her on her left, to your right, there's a man in a dark uh, blazer jacket. That's Jock Semple. He was the organizer for the marathon at the time. And when he found out a woman was in his race, he got in a follow car and eventually caught up to her and started hitting, trying to hit her saying, get out of my damn race and give me back my numbers. And there's the picture to capture that moment. So again, the question is, who are you in this picture, and who do you want the men, young men, and boys in your community, on your campus, where you work, where you live, to be in this picture? Who would they be? Now, of course, there's the role of Catherine, which is the most important. She's empowering herself, and in turn, women who empower themselves are breaking barriers that they face. She might say, I'm just trying to run a race, I'm not trying to be a hero. But what she's doing is breaking the stereotypes and the barriers that hold women and girls back. So of course that's the most important role. But the, and there's Jock, of course, which we won't talk about his role. Um, but there's three other roles, three other choices as to who we could play in this scenario, who we could be and uh, strive to be. The first choice is the guy in the uh, funky shorts right there cl close to the center of your picture to the right of Catherine on, on, on the left for us. And this man's getting involved. He's trying to step up and step back. He's not trying to be a hero. It's Catherine's race to run. But he's trying to step up and get involved and engage in this situation. And using his body language, perhaps with his voice, is trying to tell, say to Jock, hey, that's not cool. Cut it out. Stop it. So he's going to step up and get involved and then step back and let her do her thing. And that's, to me, a very important choice and a role that you can play. The second choice, the second role, is I think arguably one of the more impactful and important roles in the scenario. And that's any one of the men that are kind of like a, a semicircle or a rainbow that are around the scenario, the three in the middle. Any of those men have the opportunity to help shift and change the outcome of this situation. So for example, the guy on the left there, the turtle looking guy, <laughs> number 368. So if he gets involved and uh, he supports Jock, and with his body language, or he says, yeah, what's she doing in this race? What's wrong with her? Get her out of here. Ridiculous. That will change the momentum, won't it? Other people might think, okay, now it's two against, you know, there's two guys. I'm just going to back off. I'm just going to do my thing. I'm not going to get involved. So that could change the outcome of the scenario. But if he supports the guy in the shorts, more importantly, he supports Catherine. And with his body language, 
with his voice in some way encourages to say, yeah, that's not cool. Stop hitting her. Stop what you're doing. That will help change the outcome. That will change the, the momentum. Other men will find the permission in this scenario to also get involved. So the first follower to me is a very important part of these situations of engaging in making a difference. The third choice, of course, is the man at the bottom. Did you see the guy at the bottom? You just see his head, right? His big smiling face. He's saying, too bad for you. I got a race to run. That's not my problem. Good luck with that. Not my problem. And we choose to play one of these roles in situations around the world and in our communities and in our lives every day. Either we decide to get involved or we say it's not our problem. And for men and young men and boys in our lives, we need them to recognize that this isn't a conversation of what they should do. It's a conversation of what we must do as men, how we can get involved. Uh, I think of Dr. King, and Dr. Martin Luther King um, gave me a very strong lesson growing up when he talked about the Good Samaritan. And if you, if you don't know um, the story of the Good Samaritan, basically uh, the end result is a person who decides to get involved and help someone who's struggling. Dr. King talks about how if you understand the situation, and if you ever listen to his last um, his last speech, I've been to the mountaintop, he kind of explains this story, how the scenario that, that Christ describes really is one where the person who's on the street is in a very dangerous area, a dangerous neighborhood. And the person who, the, the two people before who pass him thinking, I'm not going to get involved because it, it might be dangerous for me. But the person who does get involved to help out weighs the question of what will happen to me if I do something with what will happen if I don't do something. Now, I don't in any way recommend anyone to put their lives in danger or put themselves at risk in getting involved, right? There's always a safe choice of things that you can do to get involved, contacting some authority figure, getting help, trying to distract. There's different ways and strategies to in interact with the situation. But there's something that we can do. I think too many men are looking the other way and not thinking about what they can say, what they can do. It's not just about coming to the aid of a helpless, defenseless women. Again, women are empowered themselves. Women are, women are leaders in this work of, of creating change. It's the roles that we can play as men. How can we support and recognize how this is affecting us as men and how we can strive to do better and be better? Roy Rana is a basketball coach here in, in Toronto, uh, and he has this great line that I love. He says, good teammates have good players. But great teammates, great teams, sorry, have great teammates. And I think for us as men, as we need, women have been, um, and people of all genders, right, who don't identify as male uh, or as men. But uh, women have had our back. Our sisters have had our back always. And it's time for us to, to show up and to turn up and be there for, for, for them as well, to have their back like they have our back and to support them. So no, notes on doing better as men. And I think hopefully some of this will help in uh, the conversations we try to have with men in, in ascending into stronger ideas of who they can be. The phrase I like to use is striving to be an ally. And I, you know, I, we can discuss this, and I have no problem with people who choose to self-claim and identify themselves. I, I personally struggle with labels. I think labels are things that people give you. Um, you know, based based on your actions, right? Based on how you do and how you live life. So for me, it's it's one thing, you know, with with all respect, right? With all due respect, men who you know go around and go up to a group of women and they'll say, "Huh, well, you know, I'm a feminist." I, I don't have much uh, regard for that. What I do think is 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 powerful if a man chooses to go up to other men, other people who identify as men, and identify as a male feminist or a feminist ally or a male ally. I think that's that's important, and that's if you're going to label yourself or identify that you are someone who's an ally. I think that's that's powerful, but it's got to be based on what you do, right? It's got to be based on action. So, like I said, ally is a title that you just can't claim. It's not this little cookie or or a ribbon that you throw in your chest. It's much more than that. It's it's how you live your life and how you carry your life throughout the journey, right? With humility, it's a life journey of learning and unlearning and being present in the conversation with respect, uh, saying I want to do better and strive to do better and I want to learn more. So a big piece of that is listening to women, right? Listening to women. Um, women have created so much information that's available online in our libraries uh, and the women in our lives who, who are willing to talk with us, you know, whether it's our loved ones and women we don't know, right? Um, there's so many women who have to end up becoming mothers for men 
and the, so much emotional labor they have to spend on supporting and raising men uh, who are their friends or colleagues. So I think it's important for us as men to respect that um, not all of them are here to, to be our mothers and to, to do that labor for us for free. Uh, and, and we need to do the work. We need to go and, and research and learn and talk with each other as men and share our notes, if you will, of what we've learned for women and what we're learning when we really think about this issue. In the classroom of being a better man, there are only students. This is my, my self-motto. I think that with, with, with ego, it becomes difficult to unlearn a lot of things. And I think if we ground ourselves in humility, that's where a lot of growth can happen. So really to place yourselves in a place of humility and recognize that I, I don't identify as a teacher or an expert. I identify as a man who's trying to do better and is on a journey. I'm striving to be an ally and I encourage other men to join me on that journey. And whether you've been doing this for you know 10 years or 80 years, you just started, you, and through your whole life you've learned and have seen so much that you can share. And I think you can learn from people who are 8 years old and people who are 80 years old. It's important with humility to ground yourself to be able to receive the lessons and the learning. I don't know who came up with this phrase. If anyone knows, please shout it out. But I love this phrase, tools, not rules. Right? I think it's important. Obviously, you know, rules are important. You know, for example, no means no. A thousand times, no means no is so important to be able to just put that out there. But that's a sentence in what's really a long conversation around consent. Because if all we say is no means no to men, there are young men and men who will say, okay, so do I keep pushing until I hear no? And there are men who are asking, well, what does yes look like? What does yes look like? What does that mean? And what, how do I get to yes? So I think it's giving men tools to have the conversation. You know? And I think that's an important part of this. Another part of this conversation, which is really, <laughs> really, really, you know, is at the crux of so many conversations right now in society, uh, is the P word. And of course, the P word is privilege. Right? So unpacking our privilege is a big part of this. Uh, and it's a very difficult thing to do. It's, a, it's something that makes people shift in their seats. It gets people uncomfortable. And, you know, their, their faces get red. And, but it's important for us to stay in that moment. Uh, Dr. Gerald Sue from the States is a great line. He says, discomfort is diagnosis or diagnostic. You know, it's like, you know, on your car when the dashboard lights up. I've been driving a car for 20 plus years. I have no idea how cars work. I just know how to open the door and maybe, you know, maybe stop it sometimes, put gas in it. That's about it. Um, and I know that when the dashboard lights out, I freak up. I go, I, you know, I freak out. I'm like, oh, God, what's going on? So I think that when we are in a situation and things start to come up for us, moments of discomfort where we feel that we're being challenged and we need, it's a learning moment for us. We need to lean into that, lean into that discomfort and getting comfortable with the discomfort. <laughs> I love this, this cartoon here. Excuse me. I, I, I think it really reflects, especially online in our online spaces now, a lot of the shaming and um, discomfort that's going on and people getting very defensive and, and turning into turning that into offense to counter what is really an important crucial learning moment that they need to, they need to sit in. <laughs> that's right Ben, not all drivers. <laughs> Absolutely. And you know leaning into the discomfort is where the real growth happens. And we need brave spaces. Now obviously you know the world is a man's space, I understand that. But I think we need to have spaces. That space can be a conversation between two men. It can be a circle or a community of, of men who are getting together to be accountable, first of all, to themselves and then to each other and to open up and be human and, and be vulnerable and share the questions that they don't know have answers to and, and, and the things that they're struggling with. And to me, those are brave spaces where we put down these masks, these performances as men, and we really strive to do better by doing that hard work. And I want to talk a bit more about that hard work. And I love this. I don't know who said this. I need to do more, more research in my quotes, right? Um, but uh, this is a great say. I saw this online, and I just love this piece. I'm learning every day to allow the space between where I am and where I want to be to inspire me and not terrify me. And if we can get more men to come into this middle ground of learning, the, the, the learning zone, right? Not a panic zone, not a place where they are shamed, but a place where they can come in and we're going to hold them accountable. We're going to push and take them the task. But, uh, you know, it's going to be a place where we're going to do that hard work. And accountability and transparency, I think, is a big piece 
in this. Being accountable as men. You know, we have these phrases in, in social justice and change communities, like hurt people hurt people. But we got to recognize that starts with us. That starts with me as a man. And I say we as men. I don't sit here and say, you know, those men are these kind of men. I put myself in that. I think it's so important to hold ourselves accountable uh, and each other accountable, right? And doing it in, in love where it's, it's about strength and, and supporting someone. And being transparent in what you're doing. Uh, transparent in what you're doing as far as, you know, we have people who are fearful of men who identify as male feminists because they think, you know, some, a lot of guys think it's a great angle to meet women. Uh, so being transparent in our, our motives and why we're doing it and basing it in humility is a big important part of this. So for me, this is building our empathy muscles. You know, a lot of men will, will not a lot, I mean, I, I'm someone who back in the day worked out for a period of my life. Um, I need to get back to it to a place of good health. Um, but for a lot of men, you know, the, the idea of, okay, to, to grow as a physical being, to grow my body, I need to go work out. And phrases like no pain, no gain are understood because the idea is that you grow your muscles by pushing them, by pushing them to the places of discomfort. So I think for us as men, we need to build our empathy muscles. It's like a mental or spiritual workout where we need to recognize we're going to push, we're going to go there, it's going to hurt. We have to talk about this stuff that, you know, we say phrases like not all men, but we need to look inside and think about, well, how, what am I doing to contribute to this conversation? Am I, am I part of this? Am I reinforcing toxic behaviors and attitudes in my own life and with those around me. So again, doing that hard work, building our empathy muscles, and giving us the tools to grow our capacity and ability to love. I don't know how many of you know the Buddhist um, incredible teacher, Thich Nhat Hanh, who Martin Luther King um, nominated for a Nobel Prize back in the day. Thich Nhat Hanh and, and, and Martin Luther King talked quite a bit together. And, and uh, Nhat Hanh talks about this idea of love and loving kindness. And he says how, you know, it's, it's one thing to say I love you or that you love yourself, but if you don't have the ability to love, right, and this is the important piece for us as men is that you know, the work that we do, the things that we do, do we know that what we're doing is causing more harm than good? Because if I love someone, but the, my inability to love, I've never been taught how to love, I've never been given the tools, to show, I've never been shown what that looks like from a male mentor like a father or a guardian. If I don't know how to love, how do I know what I'm doing is causing harm or help, right? So uh, these are important parts of the conversation. So part of the tools that we need to have as men, excuse me, are also gardening tools, how to nurture and grow these conversations uh, within ourselves. And an important part of this too is the question of, am I a safer space? You know, when we get together at events that I'm sure many of you hold, uh, we feel a bit safer in those spaces where we can, you know, with like-minded individuals, who are looking out for each other and respectful around ideas of gender equity. But the problem is that, you know, when we leave those spaces, we feel that the safe space leaves with us, right? And I think the important thing to recognize is saying that, am I a safer space, is more around, you know, like the bubble that's around you, you know, like as, as if there's a big bubble that's around you. So when you walk into a space, am I that safer space? When I walk into the room, do the men recognize that here's someone that's going to hold them accountable, that's not going to stand for, um, you know, for, for violent language, for misogynistic behavior, am I going to call them out? Am I going to hold them accountable? And for the women in this space, people, people of all genders, they feel this is someone they can come to who will support them, who will believe them if they're survivors of abuse and assault, if they are people who will still have their back and support them, be behind them. So I think it's important. It's an important piece. That's a great point, Chad, about um, the intention, right? Getting back into the the sense of you know accountability transparency why am I doing this right so getting in touch with your intention is an important piece absolutely so it's striving to be a safer space you know we can't assure or promise a safe space but I'm going to do my best and when I say that that holds me accountable I can't just say well you know you know uh, dust my hands off I'm a male feminist so I'm good to go you have to constantly be self-aware and and looking internally and checking yourself, re earning that ally card every day, so to speak, right? So striving constantly to be a safer space. Being mindful of the impact that you have and embracing the impact that you can make um, is a big piece. Being mindful of the impact that you have and embracing the impact that you make in everyday life and recognizing that it can be a positive and a strength. That's a great question, Jeremy. Um, the best tool to engage other men and becoming an active and inspiring ally. You know, I think I think really it's it's 
being able to open up and talk about stuff because it, I think one of the things I've learned over the years I've been very fortunate to talk to oh my god just like tens and tens of thousands of men and young men whether it's boys in, 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 in early grades to men in their you know in different stages of their life and I think one of the biggest things is that men are hungry to have this conversation they're, they're, if, if, if there's no one around and no one looking they're like you know what I really want to talk about this but if we create an environment and a space and that can be a space again where it's just between you and I or a space where there's more people gathered where we encourage that it's okay we can go there but we're gonna go there together you know we're gonna go there together and we can talk about this stuff and once men recognize wait a minute we can we can actually talk about this and they put down the performances they lower that that armor of masculine that toxic masculinity and they can be themselves I think that when you create that energy in that environment the doors open and they're able to really talk about it now getting them to that place is a hard it's a hard thing to do but I think that if you leave them with the impression that you are someone or you've created an environment a space where people can be who they are it allows them to lower their guards and just open up and not worry about shame and, and lean into vulnerability and have these conversations a big piece too is learning to navigate life speaking in a language of consent you know again we talk about consent and talk about consent and I think it's important to recognize that for men it's it's starting as far as not even before, you know if it's consent between two people it's before you even meet that person it's checking in with yourself what do I want what is my intention who do I want to be what do I want out of this situation right consent isn't a question that you ask at the finish line so to speak it's an ongoing space and conversation you create you navigate and you dwell in right so it's navigating the world speaking in a language of consent with everyone and whatever you do so when a woman says no it is a redirection not a rejection this is another phrase I heard this phrase redirection not a rejection online uh, on Twitter and I think it's beautiful so I think it's important for us as men to you know recognize that our frailty as men because of toxic ideas of manhood leaves us feeling you know uh, fear of shame and, and, and fear of vulnerability so if we can get to a place where we recognize that being rejected, making mistakes, falling short in failure is not a, you know, a condemnation of us as an entire human being. It's a redirection. It's saying to go back or try something different or, or keep moving on and to accept that, to learn how to hear a rejection and accept a rejection. Gavin De Becker is a security expert and he talks about how you know, when, a, when a man says no, it's the end of the conversation. But when a woman says no, it's the beginning of a negotiation. And that's that's a heartbreaking reality, right? So I think it's for men learning to hear no, learning to embrace what no means, and that it's not no to you as a human being that you are a failure and worthless, because so much of our value and self-worth is placed in these narrow ideas of power and domination and being the man and being in control. That being who we are allows us to grow in this in the face of vulnerability. So this is a, an infogram that uh, I created with a group called Sasha here in, in Canada. It's a S A C H A uh, Sasha Sexual Assault Center in Hamilton area uh, here in Canada. So if you want to look it up online, and the image is here as well, you can look at it in the slides later. Um, just some steps and ideas around men taking action against gendered violence, right? And some of the different tips and some of the tools. You know, so listening to the women in life in your life and community, learning about the struggles that have come before you, looking into your own life. I can't stress this enough. The biggest piece is looking inside. We need more mirrors. We need to look at ourselves in honesty and look at ourselves and and how we need to start the change within us so that we can be that change, right? Um, preparing, preparing to make mistakes is a big one. Accepting we're going to make mistakes. Um, that doesn't give us a license to make mistakes. Uh, people shouldn't have to suffer or be caused harm at our expense. But recognizing you're going to mess up and how you show up when you mess up is important. With integrity, with humility. I'm sorry I used that phrase. I didn't realize. Like, I, you know, again, I'm sorry I used that slide. I didn't realize the history of that slide and how I can show up and do better and be better next time and how that's better for all of us, right? Standing up against sexism, of course, and creating the world we want. The world we live in is the world we shape, right? So what are you doing to help shape that world? What are you doing to help make that world different? It's an important piece. You know, a lot of people that you'll talk to and work with will say, well, you know, Jeff, that sounds all well and good, um, but I'm not part of the problem, man. You know, like, I'm a good guy. I've never beat up anybody or anything like that. I'm, uh, I'm a good person. So peace. Good luck with that. I'm not part of the problem. And the thing I say to everyone is, if you're not part of the problem, 
What are you doing to be part of a solution? This is an issue that affects everybody in, in life in one way or another. And what are you doing to strive to be part of a solution, part of a change to this issue and how we can make a difference? Being part of the solution, again, like I said, right, is a big part of this and recognizing the role that we can play. Um, sometimes we feel that it has to, well, what, what I do is not going to make much of a difference. Like, how can I make a difference? And realizing that if you embrace the impact you make every day, you make a tremendous difference in, in everyday life. But again, like I said, the piece is about becoming the lesson in action. It's not just about what you say. You know, you're people that can recite all these great quotes and great literature, but it's about being the lesson in action. You need to be the person, be that change, you know, and it's about recognizing these phrases and terms and cliches and how it's not just about telling other people, it's about embracing it, taking it in and actually living it. You know, like I, I realized the other day, you know, like it just it really hit me. It's a bell hooks quote that I use as my email signature. And if you do email me, you'll, you'll see it uh, in the signature. And I've had it for about eight years. And I read it the other day and I just realized, it just it spoke to me again. It was like, it was like I saw it with fresh eyes. And sometimes the answers are right under your nose, you know. And it, the idea, again, that uh, we really need to embrace these, these words and to be the action and be the change, you know, that we want to see in, in men and other men. Because it's a conversation of us. It's 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 not um, us versus them. It's a conversation of us and how this issue affects us all. Um, a piece around no as a redirection. So I, I think the thing is, you know, when we as men are trying to pursue things in life and to be to be who we are. These toxic ideas of man is, is about, again, achieving through power. You have to take. The world is yours. You have to take it, right? The world is just, you know, is yours for the taking. And if this is the way we're taught to navigate life, not seeking consent in everything we do, the problem is that when we face a rejection, that, re that rejection comes in all forms. It's not just rejection as far as, um, you know, approaching a woman, uh, you know, um, for a date or approaching a woman on the street. Redirect, uh, rejection in all different aspects of our life, um, failing in a career or failing in, uh, you know, uh, you play a game. How many men, when they fail at playing sports, they, you know, they take it so personally, right? Um, so redirection, what that means is that, you know, it can mean that the lesson to take away from this experience is I need to go back and think about my intentions and how that ties into my impact. What do I want in life right now? Who do I want to be? And you know, for example, if a woman is rejecting you, so to speak, uh, in, in a very heteronormative, this is a very heteronormative conversation, but uh, if a woman's rejecting a man, that it is not, again, it is not her saying that you are a complete failure as a human being. It could be her saying, I'm sure you're a wonderful person, um, but, you know, I'm not interested in that way. And the problem is that when we create this idea that men have to have zero losses, you know, take no L's, right? Like it's, it's always about success and domination. That if that's the way you're coded, that's going to be a, become a problem when you when you come to realize that the world is not yours for the taking. That people are human beings and you need to interact in, accordingly. So I think it's really important to recognize that piece. That uh, that it's looking for the lessons and how we can strive to do better and be better. I hope that's helpful. We can talk about it a bit more at the end, um, or you can email me if you people have questions around that that phrasing. You know, they say the size of your heart is the size of your fist. So to open your heart is to open the fist. So to open up and let go. And encouraging men and encouraging you yourself, if you're listening and you identify as male, to really open up into different layers of vulnerability and, and humility to strive towards being and doing better in our world. And open the door to this conversation. Open the door to this conversation where you work, live, worship, study, hang out, and play. Um, uh, and be a place, a space, a person that people can come to for the conversation. Um, and also just recognizing on the other side of it, if you're working with men, how difficult it is for men to have these conversations and to encourage them to go seek references and research and, and read things and open their mind to this stuff and how it's not about shaming them, but it's about inspiring them to do better and to be better in their own lives. Maya Angelou has this beautiful quote that I absolutely love that I try to share every time. So do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. So I think this is a great motto to live by and an important piece for us uh, moving forward. 
And I encourage you all to keep the conversations going, to keep the conversations going in your everyday lives and uh, how we can create that world of change that we want to see, uh, maybe not in our lifetime, but there'll be a generation that will. And it starts with us taking the next steps forward and for us as people who identify as men um, to show up for these conversations, do the hard work, and become a part of change. Uh, so yeah, so that's that's the, sh the words I wanted to share with you all. My contact info is at the bottom there. Higherlearning.com if you want to find out more. My email is and contact info is there. We're on Twitter at, at uh, Jeff Pereira or at Higher and Learning, and my email is there as well. And uh, thank you so much, everyone, for attending. And uh, Emiliano, I guess I pass it off to you. And I don't, I don't know if there's any other questions or thoughts. Uh, and I hope that folks appreciate it. And I really appreciate it being with you all. But thank you so much for the words. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you so much, Jeff. We really appreciate you being with us today and uh, for sharing your insight. And we hope that folks will continue to engage you online and uh, via email. So if folks want to con contact Jeff, please do that, um, as well as continue to engage us in this conversation. We hope that you will continue to join us. We have a uh, a remaining webinar in our series on sexual violence prevention and uh, social justice. It's going to be a Google Hangout with folks uh, here at TASA as well as uh, preventioners from around the state on January the 29th. And so you can go to our website and join us for that. Um, also, if you have any additional questions, feel free to uh, post them inside of the chat box. Um, I know there was a question regarding uh, Jeff's uh, slides. Uh, a recording of today's webinar will be available, and so you can access that. Uh, if you are interested in slides, we did not, uh, for transparency's sake, we didn't ask Jeff for his permission to share the slides, and so uh, you would have to contact him directly to do that. But um, a recording will be available, and we'll post that on all of our social media platforms for you to share uh, with other folks that weren't able to attend. And uh, again, thank you so much for joining us today. And feel free to post any questions or comments or email us directly. Um, if you have any questions, I know there are folks who are looking for a certificate. If you could contact us, uh, if you could email me at TASA, that would be great. And otherwise, we hope that you guys have a great day and uh, enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you so much, Jeff. And uh, we look forward to staying in touch with you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Look forward to hearing from everyone.